Hallie Efron, I have posted a link in the in the chat as well to save us the trouble of reciting HTTP slash HallieEfron.com. I did it anyways. Is the New York Times bestselling author of 17 books, including six domestic suspense novels reviewers call deliciously creepy. Her recent Careful What You Wish For by William Morrow received a starred review. Publishers Weekly called it outstanding. And in a review in Time Magazine, Jamie Lee Curtis called it thrilling and suspenseful. Her Never Tell a Lie was made into a lifetime movie, a five-time finalist for the Mary Higgins Clark Award. Her Writing and Selling Your Mystery Novel by Writer's Digest Books was an Edgar Award finalist. Hallie is a popular presenter at events and writing conferences, including our very own Desert Nights Rising Stars Virtual Writers Conference this February. Early registration ends December 31st. She can be found on the Anthony award-winning blog, Jungle Red Writers, which I will also post a link to as well. Please join us in welcoming our final reader for this afternoon, evening, Hallie Afron. Hallie, you're muted, I'm sorry. It's nice to have this moment though. There we go. We can't read lips. I, I've been working on it. Um, another <laughs> hobby this pandemic, but all thank right. Um, I want to thank the Piper Center first. Thank you so much for, for having me on. I am thrilled to be here. Um, I'm in Boston where it's a lot colder than where you are. Um, but uh, 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 the winter solstice is soon upon us and things will get uh, warmer. Uh, very slowly. Um, I'm going to read uh, from Careful What You Wish For, which is my last book, um, which came out in paperback edition in August. And um, just to set up the scene that I'm going to read, uh, it's a short scene. Um, uh, the main character's name is Emily, and she is a professional organizer um, who who helps people declutter their houses and uh, declutter their lives is what she needs to have done for herself. Uh, so she, one of her clients is a young woman who's uh, been married about three years. Her name is Quinn and her husband will not let her bring any of her belongings that she had, most of them before they got married into their house. And so all of her old stuff is sitting in the garage and she invites Emily to come help her finally get rid of it because she's given up on trying to uh, be even more controlling than her husband. So uh, they're in the garage. They're looking at these piles of stuff. You think I'd be able to sell some of this, Quinn asked. Not that we need the money. There was no point in sugarcoating it. Emily indicated a pair of pre-war World War II mahogany chests of drawers cousins to the one she'd inherited from her grandmother. That's sturdy and nice looking, and 30 years ago you might have found a buyer, but these days it's what people refer to as, she drew air quotes, brown furniture. Frankly, it's hard to give away, but there'd be a ready buyer for that kitchen set if you put it out at a yard sale. She pointed to the 1950s kitchen table and matching chairs with their aluminum tubing and yellow vinyl seats. Oh, goody, a yard sale, and let's not invite Wally, Quinn laughed. Or you could donate. There's a ton of charities. You'd get a tax deduction. I can find one that will pick up. What I really should do is stuff all of my old shit down Wally's goddamn. Quinn broke off and stood perfectly still for a few moments. Then she put her head back and drank from the bottle of Prosecco swiped her mouth with the back of her hand. Think there are any charities that will come and pick him up? Or maybe he's just another worthless piece of, what did you call it? Brown furniture. Maybe I should just chuck him off the roof instead. Emily had picked up her glass and just taken another sip of Prosecco herself when something about the matter of fact way that Quinn said, chuck him off the roof struck her as hilarious. She laughed so hard, wine came fizzing out her nose. She clapped her hand over her face and doubled over or slipped poison mushrooms into her lasagna, his lasagna, Quinn went on, or accidentally back over him. She held up her hands as if she were holding on to a steering wheel and looked over her shoulder. 
Oops, my bad. Emily imagined the piano frame falling from their bedroom window onto Frank's head as he dragged a church pew in through their bulkhead door. She laughed and raised her glass. To death do us part. Two accidents waiting to happen, Quinn raised the bottle, then slowly lowered it. Her look turned somber. Or maybe it's safer to hire a hitman, a complete stranger, and be done with it. She gave Emily an appraising look. So could you? Could I what, Emily said, though she knew exactly what Quinn was asking. Of course, she could never kill anyone, and certainly not Frank. So maybe it was the wine, or the boyfriend's t-shirt, or the vision of that piano frame dropping from the second story window that kept her from saying so. I'll bet you would, in a heartbeat, Quinn winked, if you thought you could get away with it. So that is the setup for Careful What You Wish For. It's a little bit like, inspired by Strangers on a Train, the wonderful Patricia Highsmith book, where two husbands complain about their wives, strangers on a train, and they end up imagining one killing the other one's wife. I thought I would read very briefly also a uh, little bit from the introduction to uh, my book about uh, writing a mystery novel. I write commercial fiction, so I really feel like I'm more of a storyteller than a writer. Is there a difference? I think there's a difference. Um, but let me just read this uh, and leave you, I hope, a little inspired. It starts with a quote. In order to become even sort of good at, at it, you have to be willing to be bad at it for a long time. And that's a quote of David Owen, quoted from The New Yorker. Um, I came across that quote as I was getting ready to revise the 2005 edition of this book. The it that Mr. Owen is talking about is playing bridge, but he might as well have been talking about writing a crime novel. Another game with a steep learning curve. Almost everyone's first efforts stink. This discovery was particularly painful for me. I'd always gotten straight A's in English and I'd read a million crime novels. So it was easy to underestimate the task at hand. How hard could it be? After all, I wasn't trying to write great literature, just a gripping page turner. I was not prepared for the reality. The aforementioned stink. Learning my craft was a long, hard slog. It took me about six years to write a mystery novel that I felt was good enough to send to potential agents. And I have two manuscripts and a ton of short stories, all of them unpublished and unpublishable to show for it. Writing a mystery novel is not for the faint of heart. Juggler, conjurer, herder of cats. Be prepared to keep three or four intertwined plots spinning. Get ready to master the art of misdirection so readers will ogle the red herrings you've sprinkled throughout the story while ignoring the clues in plain sight. Don't be surprised when you find yourself trying to corral characters who refuse to do what you want them to do. And it gets even more complicated. There's no recipe for success. Ask advice from 10 successful writers and they'll swear by 10 different approaches. That's because just like you, they each have their own assortment of strengths and weaknesses. Your first draft will reflect whatever strengths and weaknesses you bring to the table. I'm often asked, can anyone learn to write a saleable novel? My answer is no, not anyone. A few are so naturally talented that they can turn out a masterpiece while barely breaking a sweat. At the other extreme are writers who even after decades of striving still churn out work that's destined to circle the drain. Aspiring writers don't necessarily fail because they lack talent. Often they lack stamina and patience needed to finish the first draft, or they're too thin skinned to hear criticism and haven't got the resilience to revise, 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 or they fold after the first few rejections and never reach the finish line. Only one thing is certain, if you never finish a first draft, you'll never know if you can get to good enough. So here's my piece of sage advice to anyone about to embark on writing a mystery novel.
Just hold your nose and write. Thank you. It's always so nice to, oh, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Zoom's terrible. No, no, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> cool. I was going to say, it's such a joy always to come on after emceeing these things. Just so happy to have experienced this and to receive such great advice as well. Right. Thank you so much, Hallie.